but I would encourage you as you're as you're making your way out and helping yourself, don't just take something. Uh, speak with and visit with our guests. Okay? And uh, we're glad to have you folks here. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we have an announcement from the boss. Father in heaven, we love you. We're grateful uh, for this day and for these guests that you've brought in to be with us. And uh, Lord, we uh, we're so mindful that it's there's a work that you are doing and it involves men. Show us the part that involves us, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs> okay, so when we spin seat on Facebook, student council is going to be decorated in the lounge on Friday, starting at 2. You should come if you want to get in the Christmas spirit. And if you want to learn how to make paper snowflakes, we're going to do that too. This is a snowflake generation, so you guys can well. <laughs> Certainly great to be here this morning to share God's word with you. Uh, as you already know, my name is Skip Pullen, and I'm a district representative on the East Coast with an organization called Village Missions. And I really would hope that you'd come by, talk to Pastor Allen, myself, and my wife, Vanita, and about the, the ministry opportunities that are there, and just find out a little bit more about the need and rural areas across Canada and the United States. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to share from God's word this morning. But before we do that, let's just open in prayer. 
Father God, we do thank you. You are almighty. And you're the one that we do adore. And as we come this morning, uh, Lord, we just continue to seek you. We seek you for what you have for us today. We seek for you what you have this morning and this time. And Lord, even throughout our lives, we want you just to be there in every moment. And we're so grateful for all that you do. Bless our time together, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you take and turn to Matthew's Gospel, the ninth chapter, and verse 35, we're going to get there in just a moment. And while you're doing that, let me just briefly share about village missions. I wanted to take some time there. My wife and I, we've served in small rural communities and small churches for over 24 years. And now for the last two years, we've served in this role as district representatives here on the East Coast, where we presently oversee 33 uh, fields in, in the East. Our, we serve all the way from Whitta Pitlock, Maine, all the way down to Oriskany, Virginia. We serve as far west as Bruin, Pennsylvania, which is out near Pittsburgh, and Buffalo, New York. And uh, so it's great to, to uh, be able to do that. It's, it's been a whole different change for us, but we would probably still be doing ministry like we were for a long time if it wasn't for the fact that God called us to this new, unique role. Our ministry story began, though, in a small rural community, a small town in southern Maine, where we attended a church that was served by Village Missions. And um, that, at that time, we, we felt God was leading into uh, ministry, and we got our Bible schooling and training. And uh, then the call, Lord called us not to the East Coast. We thought we were going to stay here in the Northeast. Matter of fact, I, we were hoping we were going to stay somewhere in northern Maine. And that was kind of our plan. We were all set to do that. And then all of a sudden, the Lord had a different plan. That church decided they didn't want to go with Village Missions. And I'm asking, where are we supposed to go? We've been waiting a long time to be placed on a field. And uh, they said, well, we got some places out in the Midwest. And I'm thinking, Kansas, Nebraska, you know. I'm thinking, what do I know about that? I'm, I'm a Maine boy, you know. And uh, it, was, it was interesting to do that. But we found out we're going to go to Waters Meet, Michigan. And I said, oh, great, that's good. So I pull out Michigan's map, and I'm looking, and I get the coordinates. You know how you look it up in the little legend and stuff? This is, this is old school. We didn't have GPS back in those days and stuff. But, so I'm looking there, and I'm looking at the coordinates, and I'm looking at the map, and the coordinates aren't even on the map. And I'm thinking, where are you taking us, Lord? You know? And I, I can't even find this place. And then I flip the map over, and there's a little inset, and there is the, on the, far, is the far end of the Upper Peninsula. I didn't even know Michigan had an Upper Peninsula. There's two, this two peninsulas, do you know that? I always knew about the little mitten part on the bottom, but there's another one that is attached to Wisconsin. And right there on the western border, right near the Wisconsin line, where US-2 and Highway 45 come together, is a little town called Waters Meet, Michigan. It's right in the middle of the Ottawa National Forest. My wife and I served there for 20 years. And six and a half of those years, we also served the second field. And it was uh, in Bruce Crossing, Michigan, which is about 20 miles uh, to the northeast of that. What's really unique about that was it was in the eastern time zone where Waters Meet, being a border town, was in the central time zone. You might have to deal with that some here. Some of you are probably from, from the states, and you may have to deal with that as you go back and forth in the, the time change. So it was really unique. We'd leave our house in Waters Meet at 7 o'clock in the morning. We'd go up to Bruce Crossing. We'd, we'd minister there for the 9 o'clock service, and we'd uh, spend some time after church and have coffee and stuff. We'd leave there about 10.30 and arrive back in Waters Meet at 10 o'clock. So, so <laughs> it's, it's a unique, it was a unique thing for us as far as ministering. We did that for six and a half years. And we were really blessed when God eventually sent a young couple to go and to be the pastor there. And they're doing a great job. They've been there for several years now. They have, they're expecting their third child. And so we're, we're really great that they settled in that community. And that's what we want to do. We want our, our couples that go to these fields to settle into those communities and become part of that community and to, uh, to, to invest their lives there. Um, like I said, we still would have been there today if the Lord hadn't called us to this ministry. You know, village missions exist to spiritually develop and revitalize churches in rural North America where there exists a need to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Village missions is a ministry that's dedicated to sending out missionary pastors to rural communities across North America with the gospel. I, I want to point out here, though, it's not just for us to keep church doors open. It's not just to be a pulpit supply, okay? There are organizations that do that, and that's great, but we're not, we, want, we want to put a full-time minister into churches where there exists that need. You know, where some churches give up any hope of having a pastor part-time or full-time, and we want to put a full-time pastor that's going to reach, help those churches reach their community with Jesus Christ. Preach the word and love the people. That's Village Mission's motto. 
And today, Village Missions has 220 village missionary couples that are currently serving all across the United States and Canada. And only heaven can measure, though, the impact this ministry has had in individual lives, churches, communities, and even around the world. But that's enough about us. Let's take, take a look at God's Word this morning. And we find here in Matthew chapter 9, and I, I was reading this some time ago in my own quiet time, and I, I looked at this part in verse, reading in verse 35. It says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I really like this. I had never noticed this before when I read, read this passage, but it says that Jesus went both to the cities and the villages. They were all important to him. You know, you, you think a person who's, who's got a mission, he's doing it, you, you hit the, the big population areas. But he even went to the small areas as well. And each of us is no doubt familiar with the Great Commission. And we know that here in the end of this, this gospel account, Matthew chapter 28. And Jesus tells his followers to go. He told them then, and I say, to go and make disciples. And, and there's a whole reoccurring thing that we continue to make disciples. And those disciples will make more disciples. And we keep that going and going. And each of us has to be part of that endeavor today. In our text, Jesus here points out, though, to the great harvest. The great harvest and the need for laborers to go into that harvest. And he tells us that few were going. In Luke chapter 10, we find Jesus is getting ready to send 70 of his disciples out by two by two. And they were going to go out. They were going to go to all the places where he was about to go and to minister to. And what he was about to do there. And he empowers these disciples. He says a similar thing here. You know, he says, pray the Lord of the harvest. To send laborers. And that's what I'd like to, what first I'd like you to notice though, is that Jesus, what he here in verse 36, he says, He saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion. We all, that means Jesus cares, doesn't it? He cares. And when Jesus cares, he acts. And that's the same today. That's his heart today. He's moved with compassion to the millions of lost souls that are right in our own midst right in our own backyards of North America. And while Christianity has seen a lot of growth around the globe, you know, you see great increases, like in South Korea, you see one of the largest churches in the world is in South Korea. You see that taking place all around the globe. North America is one continent where Christianity isn't growing. There's a lot of transfer growth, but there's not a lot of new birth, new life, you know, people coming to trust in Jesus Christ. The fields are white to harvest. But there are a few laborers that are going to that place. It's, it's approximately 78 million people that live in the rural areas of Canada and the United States. This is more than some countries have. And many of those people have no idea who Christ truly is. You know, he, he's just a name to them. He may even be, you know, a, a swear word or something like that. They have no idea what he offers. Nor are they aware of their own sin or their need for salvation. In the United States, there are some, not just towns, but there are whole counties. Can you imagine? Whole counties that don't have a Bible-preaching evangelical church. There's whole counties. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus tells his followers that they were to be witnesses to him in Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the utmost parts of the earth. You know, many people today think about foreign countries when it comes to missions. Or urban areas. You know, we got to go to the, reach the urban areas. And those are places that have a need, for sure. And if God's calling you there, praise God. And I encourage you to go in that way. But Christ wants us to go to the utmost parts of the world. All the places. I was telling you about when we went to Waters Meet. And like I say, when we looked at the, cattle and at the map, we opened up the atlas. We looked at those things. That was the, all we knew of Waters Meet until we pulled into town. We never saw anyone from there. We never got to visit the field or anything like that because it was halfway across the country. So we went sight unseen to a land that God was going to show us. And we got there. All we knew was one voice on the other end of the phone line from talking to the chairman of the board of the church there. And that was it. And when we moved to Waters Meet, people always joked that it wasn't the end of the world, but it was, you could see it from there. 
And there was even a T-shirt in the local store that said, said, end of the earth, two miles, waters meet six. So, you know, and, and, and sometimes you felt like you were out there. You know, I don't know how, how it is for some of you, but people measure things a lot of times by how far you are from Walmart, you know. And we were, we were a good hour from, from the nearest Walmart. Uh, I had an intern working with us one summer, and as he was uh, serving with us, he was corresponding with some of his friends that he went to school at from, from uh, Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, and he was, he was com- communicating with them, and they said, well, uh, get us some pictures and send us some, some pictures and stuff. And he says, well, he, he says, Walmart's an hour away. So they said, well, to go to Walgreens. And he says, that's an hour away too. You know, so it, we were some distance from places. I remember when we moved out there, I was thinking, you know, we're never going to go to Walmart ever again. It, was so, it, it seems so far away. But when you start living in those rural areas, you learn how to, how to make things and to do things and to make time for those things. Going to the uttermost parts of the earth, though. Notice that Jesus, though, tells him first, he says, begin in Jerusalem. Sometimes I think we miss that we need, also need to keep the home fires going. And we need to keep the churches in our own countries lit and ready to do what uh, Christ wants us to do. And he didn't, Jesus didn't forget them. He knew if the gospel message was going to go out, then it had to start right at home. It had to begin there. You know, each week, Village Missions is contacted by small rural churches that are asking, can you help me? Can you help our church? Do you think you could send somebody? I wish I had a closet where I could just pull a village missionary pastor off the, clo- off the shelf and give them to them, you know? And we've got, sometimes we're telling churches it may be two years before we can get somebody for them. But we want to try to help them, you know? Um, many of these churches, as I said, have given up any hope of ever having a pastor. And some of these churches were once strong, vibrant works, neither due to economic downturns that changed the industry in the area, or maybe there's been some spiritual downturns that have taken place. The churches have lost their focus. And they're weary and they're harassed, just like the people that we read about here in Matthew's Gospel. You know, and I believe Christ's heart is moved with compassion towards them. The people that were once Attending these churches are now scattered. Without a pastor to bring them the gospel, they've got a whole plethora of of thoughts and ideologies, secular philosophy, and it's all crept in, and they need a shepherd. As I said, Village Mission seeks to spiritually revitalize and develop churches in those rural areas. But we go to areas where there exists a need. We don't want to go where there's other churches that are doing that, that are, that are Bible preaching. We're not there to compete with them. We want to go to those communities that no one else is going to. We, that's what we're looking for. Right now, we have 24 fields in the United States, and we have several more here in Canada that are looking, that are waiting for leadership, for that pastor, that shepherd to come. We have a half dozen just here on the East Coast in, in our district. Notice in the text here, though Jesus says, okay, the field is white on the harvest. He doesn't say, okay, let's go set up a committee. Let's do some research. Let's get some demographics and stuff like that. Those all have their price for sure. But he says, he's, what's he telling them to do? He says, ask the Father. Pray to the Father and ask him to send laborers into the harvest. You know, sometimes when we've been out recruiting, I, especially when I first started this, I was really discouraged because it didn't seem like we were making much headway. And then I came across this part, and I said, this is where it begins. It begins by praying, praying that God would send people into the harvest. And we might all nod and agree, yeah, prayer is an important part. But do we pray about this? Ask yourself, do you pray to God asking to send laborers to go to mission fields, to, to whether, it's in the, whether it's the United States, Canada, Africa, Asia, wherever it may be? Do we pray for God to send people, laborers to those harvest fields? Or even better, do we ask, God, where do you want me to go? Where do you want to use me? And I think sometimes we get so caught up in, in what we want to do or our plans and our thoughts, uh, and we, we even get caught up in, I'm going to do a great work for God. Let me share something with you. You know, you'll never do a great work for God, but God can do a great work through you. There's a difference there. I remember we were at a conference last year, and there was a guy who was, at one time was um, a well-known um, musician, gospel singer. He was, he was asked from churches all across the United States to come and uh, 
and to sing. Matter of fact, he even had a chance to sing before the President of the United States at one point on an, on an Easter celebration. And he had all those opportunities, but God began to work on his heart and called him and said, you know, I want you to, to put aside the music and to start preaching the gospel. You know, and he started doing that. And some of it, he lost some of the music opportunities to go, but he continued to be faithful to preach God's word. And that's what we want to do. We want to be faithful to preach God's word and love God's people wherever he sends us. And know that God's going to do a work if we are faithful to him. When it, as I said, my wife and I make this a priority in our recruiting efforts now. And our Lord moves in ways that are far beyond our thoughts and our, our, our things. You know, we think, well, okay, we're going to go, we're going to go here, we're going to talk to pastors, we're going to talk to college, Bible college students, we're going to talk to them, and we'll get them thinking about rural ministry. And that's, that may be a way, but God has other ways too. Like I said, we had a whole bunch of churches in our district that were waiting for pastors. We had two fields in our district earlier this year that were waiting, and I spoke at both their churches on a Sunday morning back here. One was, was at the end of May, and one was um, at the beginning of July. And both of them asked me, he says, how soon can we expect a pastor? And I had to tell them, I says, we didn't, have anybody in, we didn't have anybody in the pipeline. There was nobody on our radar. I says, I said, I don't know. I says, it could be two, up to two years. You know, and that kind of discourages them at that point. I said, but we need to pray. We need to pray. And I'll wait, as I said, our Lord moves in ways that are beyond us. The first church was in West Paris, Maine. And I went there, and I spoke on Sunday, and, and they were asking that question. Didn't have any clue of anybody. Then I received a phone call from this guy that was out and served in Wisconsin, a little town called Cromwetter. And he and his wife had originally been missionaries to Japan, and they'd come back to the States, and they became part of a, a church planning mission, and they were there. But that ministry, he just said, I'm not called to this. I think God is calling us to the East Coast, and he wants us to be in small church in a small community where we can preach the word and get out among the people. Wow. Have I got a church for you? And so we took them through the process. We interviewed them and got them through our, our training process just to kind of help them to get up to speed to know what to expect and how our style of ministry is. And two months after my meeting with that church, this family arrived on that field. And what was really cool about it was, it was only, they were only there a couple of weeks, and their kids were talking to other kids in the community about Jesus. They got several young kids, you know, 12 and 10 and 8 and, and so. And it was, but it was great to hear that they were doing that. And they were going to school and saying, hey, we met the new kids in town. And they were talking about Jesus. We want to hear about Jesus. This is a community, you know, that needed, never heard of Jesus. Or there were kids that never heard about Jesus. And so great to be able to come alongside that church and partner with them. Another one was, it was in our district. Was, uh, we had a church in Timlin, Pennsylvania. Now, you may never know where Timlin, Pennsylvania. Anyone heard of Puxatawney, Phil? Anyone heard of Puxatawney? Okay, some of you, that's a, the groundhog that comes up every February. You know? and they, um, anyways, about 50 miles west of Punxsutawney, that's where Timlin, Pennsylvania is. It's a little community there. Um, and it's set back away from a lot of other areas. And uh, we received a call, though, from the Midwest District representative, he said, we have a field that's, that's closing. We have a church that's going to be closing. And there's a, a missionary couple there that have served us for 39 years. Is there any chance that you have any openings in Pennsylvania? Because they have a, their daughter has a family there. His aging mother ha, is living near outside of Philadelphia. And so they'd like to move there. He says, have we got a place for you? And, and, both, and they just arrived there last week. You know, so both these ones, I've told both these churches, I could be two years. But that's my thinking. But God has a better plan, and that's why it's so important for us to seek him in prayer. You know, one of the things I've been encouraged by both these couples, and I'm all our missionaries, is that they're going out into the community. They're not just staying in the church building. They're going out, and they're getting involved, and they're getting known in the community. We had another couple that we placed not too long ago, too. And they went in, and we went and visited them about a month after they'd been there. And already people were recognizing that he was the pastor. He was the pastor of the church. Just, they already made those inroads into the community. And even when he goes to other places, they say, you must be the new pastor. You know, 
And it's a great thing about rural ministry because people get to know you real fast and you get to know people real fast as well. And I think that's one of the things that I enjoyed about Village Missions is the relational aspect of getting out among the people. As I said, there are almost 78 million people who live in the heartland, that live in rural areas of North America. America. And sadly, it seems that there's a bigger is better mentality that gets in. You know, everybody says, we've got to get bigger. But nothing could be further from the truth. Small churches matter. Sometimes when we were out in the Midwest, we had different, uh, I met other pastors and that served in other areas of the Midwest, in Kansas, in Nebraska, for that matter. And we, you know, one of them talked to me about one day about the combines. And the combines that worked in the field and would harvest the grain and harvest the corn and whatever, and they would go. But in some of the areas, they couldn't get down in, so they had smaller tractors that would work those smaller areas. And the reason they did that was because all the harvest was important. Not just the big part that they could get with the big combines, but every part of it was valuable. You know, it's the same way when it comes to the harvest fields for Jesus Christ. They need someone to go into those little corners and, and to work away diligently because all those souls are important to our Lord Jesus Christ. There was a little story about a young man one day who was walking along the beach after a severe snow, after a ocean storm. He was walking along the beach and he noticed that up ahead of him there was an old beachcomber. And every once in a while, he'd see the old beachcomber stop, bend down, pick something up, throw it in the ocean. This got the young man's curiosity. And so he started walking up and he got closer. And he began to see what, what, that all across the beach was littered. It was all these starfish all across there. And so the young man watched it for a while longer as the old man kept doing that. But he saw there's thousands of them on there. And he says to the old man, he says, why are you going to keep doing this? He says, there's thousands of them. You're never going to get them all. And that's when the old beachcomber bent down, grabbed the starfish, threw it in the ocean. He says, it mattered to that one. It mattered to that one. You know, it matters to those that we go to. It matters to Jesus Christ. His heart is moved with compassion today for rural areas. And maybe there's some of you here today that maybe you never even thought about rural ministry. But I want to encourage you to maybe God's tugging on your heart to think about that. I'd like to close, as I close, just with suggest a new paradigm that small churches haven't gone by the wayside. They aren't broken. They're not wrong. They're not insignificant. They're just what Jesus Christ needs to reach those areas, to reach the rural world that are lost and headed for a crisis eternity. And we're looking for people like that. We're looking for people in village missions. Maybe some of you. Or maybe someone you know. Or maybe some of you here today know of a church that needs a pastor like that. That village missions could come alongside and help. Maybe God's calling you to this unique ministry. And if he is, we'd like to talk to you afterwards. We we'll hope to be here all day. And we'll be in the lounge and stuff later to, to talk to you. Come by the table. If you don't have an opportunity to do that because of your schedule, you can always check out villagemissions.org online. And I'd encourage you to watch the videos, watch the testimonials, see some of the things that are happening on some of these fields. Some of these fields that have waited for many, many years before they got a pastor. But I like this part here. It says, the harvest is plentiful. And I hope we see that. We can see this. It's out there. Sometimes it's hard because we're so close to it, maybe we don't see it. But it is plentiful, but the labor is a few. Let's all of us begin to ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers, whether it's here in North America or around the world, that we'd be seeking God to send laborers into his harvest. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful. We're, we're thankful that you share your heart with us through your son Jesus Christ and through your word. And, and Lord, that we can know that you have compassion. And Lord, I, I pray for these students. I pray you help them. Whatever you, you're leading them to, I pray that you're, you, you would bless them in, in those endeavors and, you'd be, and they'd be listening to you and hearing from you. I pray that you bless their, their times alone in your word with, as well as their times of worship with each other. I pray that you would continue to help them as they learn you'd, and you'd be directing their paths. 
I pray, Father, that, that each one would be walking in your ways and in your will. And Lord, we, we just thank you again for the opportunity you've given me to be here. And Lord, I pray that you continue to uh, re- reveal yourself to all who are gathered here this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.